Now, we are in the middle of a series, uh, walking through the life of Joseph. This is Joseph in the Old Testament, not Joseph and Mary in the New Testament. This is uh, Joseph in the Old Testament in Genesis. So if you've got a Bible, we'll be in Genesis chapter 40. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, as always, after the service down front, I have one that's a free gift for you. I'd love to give it to you for you to have a copy of God's Word in hand. Genesis chapter 40, while you're turning there, I'm going to read uh, out of Romans 11. It'll kind of tee up where we're going. I'll pray for us. And I'll jump into the message. So this is Romans 11. I'm going to read verse 33 through 36. This is the Apostle Paul writing, then I'll pray. Here's what he says. He says, oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible is it for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts and who knows enough to give him advice and who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back for everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. Let me pray for us. Jesus, I thank you for who you are. And God, my prayer is in this moment, the spirit of God would begin to move in our hearts and souls and minds. You'd shape us to become more and more like Christ. God, as we walk after you and follow you every step and every day of our lives. We love you, Jesus. I ask these things in your name. Amen. So when I was in 17 in high school, I went on a mission trip uh, with about 10 or 15 other high schoolers. We went down to Haiti, <clears throat> and we built churches and things like that, did some vacation Bible schools. Spent about a week down there uh, with our, I think, three or four adult uh, mentors and chaperones down there. At the end of the week, we're flying back. So we're leaving from Haiti, flying back to the United States, about 10 or 15 of us um, and our adult chaperones. Uh, we go through customs in Haiti before we get on the airplane, and everybody in our group makes it through customs, no problem except for yours truly. And the customs officers just wanted to have a more in-depth conversation with Chris and ask me some questions about what I was doing there, what I was bringing back, all this type of stuff. Uh, and it went longer and longer, and they began to search through my suitcases and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it went really long, so much so that the whole group made it through, um, and the adult chaperones are looking at the flight board and realizing the plane's, you know, about to leave. And so the adult chaperone comes and is like, hey, you know, and I'm on this side, they're on that side, they're like, hey, uh, we've got to get everybody on the plane you know where it's at. We hope to see you on there. <laughs> and then they leave. And I was like, well, this is fascinating type of deal. You know, I'm 17 and I'm here in, in Haiti and customs. And so they just begin to ask things and searching through things. You know, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm doing the Lord's work type of deal. And, uh, and so it goes and it goes on and on. They finally go, okay, you're fine. I'm putting all my clothes back in the suitcase, that kind of stuff. I look up at the board and when the plane's about to leave and where the gate is. And I just sprint as hard and as fast as I can. Now, up until 17, I hadn't really flown that much. And up until that point, as a kid, you're always told, don't run. Quit running. Stop running around the pool. Don't run to the store. Calm down. Just sit down. But in the airport, when you run, people applaud. They want you to make your airplane, and then they play the theme song from Chariots of Fire when you're sprinting, do, do that, that kind of stuff. And so I make it all the way to the gate, and I'm there, and I'm about the, I'm the last one right before they close the gate door. And I get on, walk down the tarmac, and I get on the airplane. And I'm walking down the aisle, and I see the adult chaperone. He's like, oh, you made it. And I'm like, yeah, I made it on the airplane type of deal. <laughs> no thanks to you. Now, I share that with you because at that moment of 17, I realized, oh, uh, I have been left here all alone, and I felt a little forgotten by everybody. They were on their, their flight, and I'm here trying to make it through. And I share that with you because we're looking at Joseph's life, and Joseph, up until this point, and even through this point, he's forgotten. He's forgotten by his family. He's forgotten by Potiphar. And then today you're going to see he's forgotten by a prison inmate that he helps out and does a really nice thing for. He's forgotten for two full years there in the prison. And I don't know about you, but in, in your life, my guess is you have felt forgotten by people. Forgotten by people at work, forgotten by people in, in relationships, forgotten by people at school, or maybe even forgotten by God. And so here's the question I want to wrestle with today. And the question is this, is what if God wants to use you and wants to use your life differently than what you had expected? What if God wants to use your life and you and, and how you operate differently than what you had expected? See, if you're in this room and you're not a Christian, the good news is for Christians, the cool thing is, and it's kind of the overwhelming thing, is that as Christians, God wants to use us, mere mortal, sinful human beings, 
for his glory. So a holy, perfect God wants to use unholy, sinful, and perfect people for his glory. And so the cool thing is when you become a believer, a follower of Jesus, your life and what you do and what you say and how you interact and where you go to school and how you work and how you make money and how you give and how you help people and your influence, all of, all of that is for, should be for the glory of God. And so people go, what's the purpose of life? As a follower of Jesus, our purpose on this earth is to glorify God. But what happens is you become a, a Christian and you realize that God wants to use you, you go, great. And you kind of slide your resume across the table to God and go, this is what I'm really good at. This is when I think I should be married. This is when I think I should have kids. This is how many kids I should think I should have. This is when I think I should become independently wealthy. This is when I think I should retire. This is how much influence I think I should have. This is how healthy I think I should be. And you slide it across the table and go, go, okay, God, use me. But what happens if God wants to use you and your life and your influence, your finances, your health? What if he wants to use it in a way differently than what you had expected? So what if you're 30 years old and you're single and you think to yourself, I kind of thought by now I would be married. Or maybe you've been married 10 or 15 years and you think, gosh, by now I thought we would have had kids. Or you've been working for a while, I kind of thought by now I would have exited out of this company. I kind of thought by now I would be retired. I kind of thought by now that I would be healed and be healthy. I kind of thought by now things would be different. And you're going, has God forgotten about me? Does he know where I'm at? Does he know where I want to be? Does, Does he know what I'm good at? Does he know my influence, my skills and abilities? And if you've ever felt like that, Joseph is in the exact same situation. He's locked away, rotting in an Egyptian prison, forgotten about. And this is where the story picks up. Genesis chapter 40. We're going to pick it up in verse 5. It says, while they were in prison, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker each had a dream one night, and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph saw them the next morning, he noticed that they both looked upset. Why do you look so worried today, he asked them. And they replied, we both had dreams last night, but no one can tell us what they mean. Interpreting dreams is God's business, Joseph replied. Go ahead and tell me your dreams. Now, if you missed last week, uh, he was sold into slavery, bought by a guy named Potiphar, worked for Potiphar. Potiphar's wife wrongfully accused Joseph of rape. Potiphar takes him, throws him into prison. Joseph begins to work his way up, and he's number two in charge over the prison. So he's there, and he runs into this cupbearer, and this baker both used to work for Pharaoh. They're there in prison. They've done something to upset Pharaoh. They're there, and they have these crazy dreams, and they want to know what's going to happen. And Joseph goes, listen, I can't interpret them, but God can. And so they begin to tell them his dreams. And the cupbearer had this weird dream about grapes, and here's what Joseph says. Look at verse 12. He says, this is what the dream means, Joseph said. The three branches represent three days. And within three days, Pharaoh will lift you up and restore you to your your position as chief cupbearer. And please remember me and do me a favor when things go well for you. Mention me to Pharaoh so he might let me out of this place. For I was kidnapped from my homeland, the land of the Hebrews, and now I'm here in prison, but I did nothing to deserve it. So he has this crazy dream about grapes and Joseph goes, hey, that's good news. In three days, you're going to be lifted up out of here. You're going to be restored. It's all going to be good. Hey, by the way, you know, when when you're back there, if you wouldn't mind mentioning me to Pharaoh, maybe kind of help me out, get me out of here. No problem. Well, the baker hears this, and he's like, oh, my goodness, he got some good news. Let me tell you my dream. So he begins to tell his dream to Joseph, but, but his dream doesn't have near as much good news. Look at verse 18. After he dreams about pastries and things like that, verse 18. He says, this is what the dream means, Joseph told him, and the baker's there listening. Three baskets also represent three days. I'm sure the baker's like, yes, just like the cupbearer, verse 19. Three days from now, Pharaoh will lift you up, yes, and impale your body on a pole, no. <laughs> then birds will come and peck away at your flesh. You're like, wait a minute, wait, 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 can we go back? I like, I like the cupbearer's dream. Yeah, three days, yep, he'll lift you up, yep, and three days, what? You're going to be impaled on a pole. Yeah, not the way I saw that going this time. And so in this moment, it is there, and there's the two dreams. And he goes, things are going to go well, things are not going to go well. Then look what happens in verse 20. The dreams come true, verse 20. Pharaoh's birthday came three days later. He prepared a banquet for all three of his officials and staff. And he summoned his chief cupbearer and chief baker to join the other officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his former position so he could again hand Pharaoh his cup, but... 
Pharaoh impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph had predicted when he interrupted, when he interpreted his dream. Verse 23. Pharaoh's chief cupbearer, however, forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. After three days, tell us the dream, it's going to be good news, you're going to be restored, it's going to be good. Hey, do me a favor, remember me. Yeah, no problem, I got you, Joseph, don't worry about this. Three days later, he's there, he gets restored, and Joseph is forgotten to rot away in Egyptian prison with nobody giving him another thought. Two full years pass, and Pharaoh has a weird dream, and nobody can interpret it. Nobody knows what it means, and all of a sudden, the cupboard goes, oh, yeah, I kind of forgot. Man, this is my bad. Hey, two years ago, there was this kid in prison, and I had a dream, and gosh, what he said, it came through. Maybe he can help out. So Pharaoh brings Joseph, and look at chapter 41, verse 14. It says, Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once. And he was quickly brought from the prison. And after he shaved and changed his clothes, he went in and stood before Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream last night, but no one here can tell me what it means. But I have heard that when you hear about a dream, you can interpret it. Like, hey, I've I've heard, you know, the chief cupbearer says some things. And then Joseph corrects him on one little thing. Verse 16. It is beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied, but... But God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. Forgotten about rotting away, forgotten by his family, forgotten by Potiphar, forgotten by the cupbearer for two full years. And here he is, he's finally brought in front of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh goes, hey, I hear you can, you know, interpret dreams. He goes, no, 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 I can't, but God can. So Pharaoh tells him this dream about some cows and some things. And Joseph interprets it, verse 25. Joseph responded, Both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he's about to do. The seven healthy cows and the seven healthy heads of grain both represent seven years of prosperity. The seven thin scrawny cows that came up later and the seven thin heads of grain withered by the east wind represent seven years of famine. This will happen just as I have described it. For God has revealed to Pharaoh in advance what he's about to do. The next seven years will be a period of great prosperity throughout the land of Egypt. But afterward, there'll be seven years of famine so great that all the prosperity will be forgotten in Egypt. Famine will destroy the land and this famine will be so severe that even the memory of the good years will be erased. As for having two similar dreams, it means that these events have been decreed by God and he will soon make them happen. He goes, hey, listen, I had two dreams. He goes, great. He goes, here's what they mean. It's going to be seven years of bumper crops and prosperity and all the things and blessings. That's going to be followed by seven years of famine so bad you will forget how good the good seven years were. And by the way, this is going to happen soon. And so Pharaoh goes, man, what, what should I do? And Joseph goes, you should find somebody really smart and really intelligent and really, you know, in charge. They can manage everything. That way you save up all the crops in the seven years and then you can live off of it in the seven bad years. And look what happens in verse 37. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of his dreams to you, clearly no one else is intelligent or as wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court, and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a rank higher than yours. Look at verse 46. He was 30 years old when he began serving in the court of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And when Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he inspected the entire land of Egypt. So he's there, seven bad years, can be seven good years. Who do I find? And Pharaoh goes, you're the guy. There's nobody more obviously filled with the Spirit of God. And he's 30 years old, and he's sitting there, number two in charge behind Pharaoh. And for the next seven years, it's a bumper crop, and they store up everything. And then the seven years after that is a destitute famine. We'll end it with verse 56 and 57. It says, so with severe famine everywhere, Joseph opened up the storehouses and distributed grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout the land of Egypt. And people from all around came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe throughout the entire world. 
Now, there's a little math problem you and I need to do. He's 30 years old when he becomes second in charge. He's 17 when he has the dream that his brothers get mad about. 30 minus 17 is 13 years. From the time he had the dream that he would be in charge to the whole 13 years of when God brought him and delivered him. And here's what I want you to know and grasp from this simple little story, and it's this, is that God knows where you are at, and he can get you to where he wants you to be. God knows exactly where you are at in your waiting, in your frustration, in your hurt. He knows where you're at. He can get you to where he wants you to be. But there's a caveat, and the caveat is this. It's but how and when he wants you to get there. God knows where you're at and he can get you to where he wants you to be, but it's how and when he wants you to get there. And for so many of us, again, we're ready. We're following Jesus. Let's go, God. I've got a plan. I've got a direction. I've got my own timetable. Let's go. And God goes, listen, I know where you're at and I've got a plan. I know where I want you to be, but how and when the course and the path you get there is totally on me and walking and you walking and following my ways. He knows where you're at. And he can get you where he wants you to be, but it's how and when he wants you to get there. But what's interesting is in 1 Peter 5, 6, Peter would say, humble yourselves under the mighty power of God. And in the right time or in his time, he will lift you up in honor. And so if we understand that, if we understand that you and I are supposed to be vessels used by God for his glory, for his power, for his purpose... We also need to understand it's also in how he wants and when he wants. Then you and I, our job is to humble ourselves and say, it's God and how and when he wants to. And I'm just the vessel and I'll be used however and whenever he wants to use me. Not for my glory, but for his. So I just want to point out a couple of things about Joseph's life. I want you to go back and look at verse 16 in chapter 41. He's brought before Pharaoh and he says, it is beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied. He says, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. First idea I'd love for you to write down and think about is simply this, is to be humble enough to be used however God wants. Be humble enough to be used however God wants. Joseph could have easily said when Pharaoh goes, hey, I hear you can interpret dreams. Joseph could have said, I absolutely can. Tell me your dream and I'll give it to you. He goes, no, 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 no. It's not me. Joseph goes, I'm just the vessel or the tool that God uses. It's God that interprets the dreams. I'm just the voice. I'm just the mouthpiece. of what, But God is the one that does the interpreting. And I would encourage you to be humble enough to be used however God wants to use you. Because in your life, my guess is you want to change the world. And whatever that means for you. You've got something in mind. If I do this, then I can change the world or I can make a difference. And that absolutely might be God's plan for your life. However, instead of you change the world, you're calling how God may want to use you. You might be the person raising the kid that's going to change the world. Or you might be the person praying intense prayers for the person that's going to change the world. Or maybe you're the person that financially backs that person that's going to change the world. Maybe you change the world in whatever that looks like in your mind. Or maybe God says, I want to use you in a different way. I want to use your influence. I want to use your voice. I want to use your life. I want to use your health. I want to use your situation for my glory and my power. And our job is just to humbly say, God, I'm in for however and whenever that you want to use me. Not going, God, here's my plan. I hope you get on board. Be humble enough to use however God wants to use you. A couple of weeks ago, our washing machine broke. We had the same washing machine for 14 years, and it finally gave away. And uh, Brianna goes, hey, our washing machine broke. We can get a new one. And I'm like, are you sure it broke? Like, did it really break? And she goes, no, it it really did break. She goes, it's been 14 years. I was like, let's try it, you know, another few days. And it it was broken. She goes, we got to get a new one. I was like, okay. Now, if you're new to our church, it's well documented that I am a cheapskate. I think it's a spiritual gift that God has given me to sniff out great deals and just be cheap. And uh, so same applied here. And she goes, I'm going to get a washing machine. I was like, okay, but get a used washing machine. Get us. Oh, don't gross. Yeah. If you would like to donate to a brand new one, I'll take that donation. <laughs> It's like, just get it used, scratch and dent, it's fine. She goes, okay. So she finds a scratch and dent one at the store. She calls me, she goes, hey, the only problem is they don't deliver. I was like, that's no problem. You can handle it. 
and she's like, well, I was like, I'll do, they'll load in the back of your SUV and we'll unload it here at the house. She's like, okay. So they forklift it up and they, they load it in the back of her SUV and she drives it home. That evening I get home, she goes, okay, we've got to unload the washing machine. Go, okay. So she backs up to kind of our front door and there's a sidewalk and some steps up to our front door. She opens up the trunk and there's a washing machine. No problem. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but washing machines are heavier than one might think. And so Brianna and my oldest son Daniel gets on one side to lift, and I get on this side to lift, and I go one, two, three, lift. And they lift it, and their part goes up, and my part stayed there. <laughs> and I lifted and lifted. Now, if I was 20 years younger, I would have just muscled through it, but I'm 40, and I like to think that I've matured and gotten wiser. And I was like, we got to come up with a better idea. And Brianna goes, I've got an idea. She goes, why don't you call some buddies of yours to help you move it? I was like, I ain't doing that. <laughs> no way. So I may be 40, but I'm a little prideful. And so she goes, uh, okay, what do you want to do? I said, I'll figure this out. So I kind of thought about it. I go, oh, here's what we'll do. So we took it and we tilted it and it slid out of her SUV and onto the ground. And there. And she pulled her SUV away. I was like, there. Step one's done. She goes, great. What's next? It's like, I don't know. I just had step one figured out. And she goes, well, we got to get it from here up to there. And I go, I got an idea. So I go to the garage and I find this. And I got this guy right here. I got this two by four. And she, she's like, what are you going to do with that? I said, watch this. So I lay this two by four on the ground and then we put the washing machine on top of it, and we just slid it to the edge of the sidewalk. She goes, great, how are you going to get up the stairs? I go, I'm glad you asked. So I take this two-by-four, and I put it just like that, three and a half inch wide, two-by-four, washing machine. I said, okay, and I got Daniel on this side and, and, and Brianna, and we just shove it all the way up, and we get up to the top, boom, and it's there. I go, this is fantastic. We get it in the house, and we put it on furniture uh, movers, and we slide it all the way through to the room where it's going, and we've got one final doorway to clear. And this washing machine is a half inch too wide to get through this doorway. I said, ah, don't worry about this. I got this one. So I went and I get this little screwdriver right here. So I take the hammer, pop, 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 pop all the pins out of the doors, pop off the door, put it on the side. It slides right through there, put it in place, take the old washing machine out, put it there on the, on the front porch, get rid of it. And I thought, who needs a delivery man? Now, if you had asked this two by four, two by four, how would you like to be used in life? This two by four would probably say, I'd like to be in the wall of a mansion. I'd like to be used to build a support wall, an exterior support wall for a mansion. I bet if you asked the two by four, would you like to be thrown on the ground and slid across by a washing machine, then thrown on some steps and then slid up the steps and wash them? The two by four would go, absolutely not. I want to be used in a wall. If you ask this screwdriver, screwdriver, how would you like to be used? Screwdriver would say, well, I'm a Phillips head screwdriver, so... I'll just take Phillips screws and turn them either this way or this way. And I go, no, 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 no. I'm going to turn you upside down and I'm going to hit you as hard as I can with a hammer to knock out the pins of a door. Screwdriver say, absolutely not. Screwdriver say, no, no, I'm good if you want to use me for, you know, installing Phillips head screws. Two by four goes, I'm good if you want to use me inside of a mansion. I'm going, no, 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 no. I need you to lay on the ground and be slid against. I need you to be upside down and be hammered against. The reason why is, yes, you might want to be in the mansion. You might want to, to, to work with Phillips screws. But here's what I need you for. What I need you for as the tool may not be exactly what you thought to be. And I think for so many of us, we're like, no, no, here's what I want to be used. I want to be prominent in the mansion. This is what I want to be used. And God's going, no, 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 no. I need you on the ground. I need you humble on the ground. I need you upside down. You're going, well, this is not exactly what I had in mind. No, but it's what God needs you for in that moment. And you and I just have to be humble enough to be on the ground rather than in a mansion. You and I have to be humble enough to be upside down, being used how God wants, even if it's not what we originally thought our life would go. And you see Joseph, 13 years, sold into slavery from his brothers, bought by Potiphar, wrongly accused by Potiphar's wife, forgotten about, riding away in a prison. And in that moment, he goes, listen, God is the one that interprets dreams. I'm just the vessel to be used. Be humble enough to be used however God wants. And I want to point out one other thing. Look at verse 46. It's interesting throughout Joseph's story, it just gives us a bunch of time and, and ages. Verse 46, it says, he was 30 years old when he began serving in the court of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And when Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he inspected the entire land of Egypt, 40 years old. So you understand he was 17 when he had the dream that he was going to be in charge. He's 30 years old, so that's a 13-year gap. Now, the problem is when you and I, when we read the Old Testament, you and I flip two pages and we've just skipped 13 years. 
Right? You, you go read stories and you flip a page and it said, in years past, or four years past, 13 years past, and it kind of becomes dull to our senses. 13 years go by. You and I get frustrated. We have to wait two weeks for anything. This is 13 years that we just flip over in two pages. Imagine your life 13 years ago in 2009. What you were doing in 2009, what your dating relationship was like, what your marriage was like, what your finances were like, what your health was like, what your job situation was like in 2009 compared to 2022, that is a massive 13-year gap and a lot changes. But for so many of us, we put God on our timeline. We go, okay, God, I'm ready to be used now. I mean, I'll wait a couple of days, but 13 years to be forgotten about, to be rotting away in a prison, to be left there and just forgotten about for the rest of his life. And God goes, now is the time. Now when you're 30, now I put you up and promise I'm using you the way I want you to, want to use you, when I want to use you. And for so many of us, 13 years, we don't even want to wait 13 days, let alone 13 years. We want God to work in us. We want it to be moved, but we want it to be on our time. And, and the humble thing is going, no, 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 Lord, it's in your timing and in your way. Whether it's 13 days or 13 years, Lord, I'm going to wait and allow you to move on my behalf and allow my life to bring you glory. One of my favorite preachers is a guy named Chuck Swindoll. And Chuck is a big pastor in, uh, in Dallas, Texas. And he's, I think he's like 87 years old. And I've listened to him for years, but he's an 87-year-old, but he preaches with the energy and passion of a 37-year-old. And he's just a wonderful storyteller, just an incredible faithful preacher. And I was listening to a podcast that he was on a couple of years ago. And it was one of these like the top 10 or top 15 things that he had learned in 60 years of ministry. And I don't remember all of the things except for one. It was one of the top 10, top 15 things. And he talks about this idea of force versus flow. Force versus flow. And he goes, when God is in something, he goes, it flows. He goes, when God's not in it and humans make it happen, he goes, it's forced. And he goes, I'm here to tell you that the flow of God's will is far greater than the force of human will. And so you and I in our lives, we force things. We want things to happen. It's the square peg and the round hole. Why? Because this is the way it's got to be. And God's going, no, no, no. If you just wait, if you would just waited a month, if you just waited a year, if you just waited a day and allowed me to move, it would have flowed so much easier. But instead, you forced it. And maybe you've got a big enough personality where you can just force a square peg in a round hole and make it work. But God's going, you're missing out on so much. If you would have waited, if there would have been an element of patience in your life and wait quietly before the Lord and allow Him to open up the right doors and close the wrong one, there would have been this, this moment of things flowing in your life rather than forcing them. But again, so many of us, we cross our arms and we get patience. We cannot Im imagine waiting 13 years for God to answer something. We, we don't even want to wait 13 days. And so we force things and we want God to move on our timeline. But the humble thing is going, no, 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 God. However and whenever you want to move and you want to work, I'm in. And I'm a vessel to be used how and when, but it's for your glory. Now, by a show of hands, I'm curious, how many of you, you're like me? And you either own or you have owned or you have the skill set at least of you're able to drive a manual transmission car. Let me see a show of hands. Yes, you're my people. Okay, good. All right. So my first car ever was a 1990 Isuzu pickup with a five-speed manual shifter and no power steering. It was brutal to try to parallel and park that thing. My grandfather taught me how to drive a manual transmission. I appreciate that. But my dad taught me all the cool things that you could do with a manual transmission. And if you've ever driven a manual transmission, you know some of those cool things. Uh, one of the cool things is you can shift without using a clutch. And I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, kind of cool trick. I wouldn't recommend doing it all the time. But you can shift gears without using the clutch. It's kind of a cool trick to show the pass person the passenger seat. And in my truck, it was easiest going from third to fourth gear. And my dad told me, he goes, listen, he goes, you'll listen to your truck. And he goes, you have to time it out right. You'll listen to the engine and the timing. And he goes, you'll learn it. And then when that happens, he goes, it'll slide right from third to fourth. You let off the gas, it'll slide right from third to fourth. You don't have to push in the clutch. And he goes, but if you mistime it, if you go a little too early or a little too late, you don't listen to the timing of the engine, he goes, you will grind the gears. And gosh, learning that trick, it was always too early. And you pull it out a third and grind and grind it in a fourth. But... If you listen to the engine just right and at the right time, at the right moment, it would just slip, boom, boom, from third to fourth, no problem at all. The same is true for your life. 
Go, listen, I think this is where God's calling me, what he wants me to do, great, great. Is now the right time? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but it's your job and my job to be humble enough to listen to the voice of God in our life going, listen, is this the right time? If it is, then it'll flow from third to fourth, no problem. If it's you under your power and under your will, it will grind the gears, it'll be forced. Maybe you can make it happen, but when God's in it, it just begins to work. Joseph goes from rotting away in a prison to being number two in charge of the palace behind Pharaoh in a day. When God's in it, it will move and it will work and it will flow and it will just happen in God's way and God's time. And your job and my job is to go, listen, however and whenever God wants me, it's my job to swallow my pride and walk humility and go, God, if you're in it, I'm in no matter what. So where does the rubber meet the road on this? You're going, okay, Chris, I get this. I need to be humble enough. However, whenever, but Chris, how do I know when God wants me to do something? How do I know how he wants me to do something? Let me just give you like three thoughts that I've worked in my own prayer life that I've given to people over the years to try one of these or all three of these, just as you begin to think. If you've got a major decision or you're wrestling with something, here's what I do personally and what I've recommended people for you. Three, three of them. First is this. It's the idea of force versus flow. It's the idea of clarity versus ambiguity. And the idea of open versus closed. Force versus flow, clarity versus ambiguity, and open versus closed. And so I always ask, Lord, but if you're in it, Lord, I pray that this thing flows and I don't want to force it. I don't want Chris to force whatever it is to happen. An opportunity, something going on, Lord, I want this to flow from you. If I've got a big decision, God, I want clarity in this decision. I don't want it to be ambiguous. Because God, if, there, if there's clarity, I don't care how difficult the decision is, how tough it might be, if it's clarity, I will walk in confidence, but I've got to know that it's clear from God, this is what he wants me to do. And then the final thing I pray is open doors versus closed doors. Lord, I pray that you'd open up the right doors in my life and close the wrong ones. Lord, I pray that you'd swing open wide the doors that I'm supposed to walk through. God, I pray that you'd close shut, slam shut the doors that I should not be walking through. And the reason why I pray this is because they work in reverse order. God, if, if you'll open up the right door, I'm trusting that that will be clear enough for me to walk through it and then it will just flow. God, I pray that you would slam the close the wrong door. I'm not going to kick it down. That will be clear that I'm not supposed to do this, and I'm not going to force it and make it happen. You and I are to be used as vessels, as tools for God's glory. When people look at us, they shouldn't glorify us. They should glorify our Father in heaven. But what, but what if God wants to use you in a different way, in a different time than what you and I had originally envisioned? Would you be humble enough to swallow your pride and say, Lord, I don't know how, and I don't know when, but I'm in. Lord, I don't know how. Lord, I don't know when, but I'm in. I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know when this is going to work out, but God, I'm in no matter what. Would you have that enough faith in your life, enough humility in your life to go, you know what, it doesn't make sense. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I'm raising my hand saying, God, I'm in no matter what. Even if it takes 13 years of waiting and being forgotten about, God, I'm trusting that you're in it, and I want my life to be used to display the glory of God. I'll finish with this. And it's what the psalmist wrote in Psalms 105, and it's fascinating what the psalmist writes, because he writes about Joseph in this moment. In Psalm 105, verse 16, the psalmist writes this. It says, he, meaning God, called for a famine on the land of Canaan, cutting off its food supply. Look at this. Then he sent someone to Egypt ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet with fetters, placed his neck in an iron collar, Verse 19, until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. Then Pharaoh sent for him and set him free. The ruler of the nation opened his prison door. Joseph was put in charge of all the king's household. He became ruler over all the king's possessions, and he could instruct the king's aides as he pleased and teach the king's advisors. But not until the time came for the Lord to fulfill his dreams. Until that point, there are some character issues in Joseph's life that need to work out. Until that point, there was some pain that Joseph needed to experience. Until that point, there were some things that God was working out in his life for 13 years. But 
in God's timing and in God's way. And one day he's raised from rotting away, being forgotten about in the prison, to being second in command over all of Egypt. But it was in God's timing and in God's way. The question is, will you and I have the humility enough to say, Lord, I don't know how and I don't know when, but I'm in. Let me pray for us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I realize that probably most of you in this room, at some point you've placed your faith in Jesus. But maybe God hasn't used you exactly the way you thought or hoped, or maybe it's taken a lot longer. Maybe there's some things that you're going, gosh, Lord, I kind of thought by now this would have happened or this would have been different. But maybe right now there's a physical posture of just taking your fists and opening them up and saying, God, with open arms, with open hands, my life is yours. However and whenever you want to, God, I'm in no matter what. And while you're working through that, let me speak to those of you in this room or maybe watching online that you've never placed your faith in Jesus. The good news is, is that the God of the universe wants a personal relationship with you. And he wants to use your life, use you as a vessel, as a tool for his glory. The holy, perfect God of the universe wants to use broken people like you and like me for his glory. And the good news is, is that you can be used by God and you can have a personal relationship with God. All you have to do is place your faith in his son, Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. If you place your faith in him, make him the Lord and Savior of your life. Scripture says that you will be saved. You will experience a peace and a hope that you cannot possibly understand. If you're ready to, do, to receive that, you're ready to place your faith in him, say something like this. What's important is that you mean it from the depths of your heart. Just say, today, Jesus, I trust you. I ask your forgiveness for all my sins. Please fill me with your spirit. Teach me from your word. And help me to live for you from this day forward. Thank you for my salvation. Father, I pray for all of us. God, my prayer is that our life doesn't follow our plan, but it follows yours. God, that our life and all of our experiences and all of our influence and all of our finances and all of our health, everything, God, will be used for your glory, however and whenever you want to use them. Lord, my prayer is that we as a church are here with arms open wide saying, God, we are broken individuals, but we want to be used by you. We love you, Jesus. I ask these things in your name. Amen.